our online Zoom lecture. My name is Noah O'Bright. I am the museum ambassador for Texas Through Time Fossil Museum in Hillsborough, Texas. Um, we wanted to, uh, lately we've been starting up a new lecture series. We did two last month at the Hill County Gen uh, Fossil Mineral Expo. Um, we're very grateful to have uh, John uh, help us out with this lecture this time. Um, we will, we do plan on doing more lectures in the future. Uh, we have one next month scheduled uh, for December 17th. That one will be in person, but we will be recording that one as well. Um, we're very uh, grateful to have John uh, uh, do his lecture on trilobites today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to John. He can introduce himself. Um, and John, you can tell, tell a little background and go ahead and, and get started. Again, I ask anyone who is in here to please mute your mic and uh, turn off your um, video camera. And then at the end, uh, you can turn it back on and we can have a uh, Q&A. Perfect. All right. All right. Well, as Noah said, my name is, uh, my name's John. Uh, by degree, I'm a geologist, but for the past five, six years, I've worked in paleontology. I've done a lot of uh, field work and laboratory work. And in the past couple years, I started my own fossil preparation business. So long story short, I clean up fossils when they need cleaning. Uh, and since I started that out, uh, I've got to work with a lot of spectacular fossils. Uh, but from the beginning, I began to specialize in trilobites. And when you're staring through a microscope at a certain fossil all day, every day, 40 hours a week, you get to know them pretty well. So I think I, uh, I've got a thing or two to say about these very interesting ancient organisms. And uh, right off the bat, what is a trilobite? Well, first and foremost, trilobites are animals. They belong to kingdom animalia. And they fall under the phylum of arthropoda. They are arthropods. If you're not familiar with arthropods, you should be. They are absolutely everywhere. A good portion of the biomass on this planet right now is made up of arthropods. Everything from beetles to ants to crabs to spiders to scorpions, they're all arthropods. They are a very, very successful group of organisms, and they've been very successful for a very long time. They're defined by having paired jointed legs, exoskeletons that they have to molt in order to grow, segmented bodies, and... Yeah, that's, that's the general definition of an arthropod. Trilobites make up an entire class of arthropods. Now, a class, getting into kingdom phylum class, we're talking about Linnaean taxonomy, which is a, the current system for categorizing life. Uh, it's not perfect. We'll get into that for a second. But a class is a very large grouping of organisms. For example, making the comparison to ourselves, humans fall under the phylum chordata, and we are under the class mammalia. So everything from whales to us fall under a class. It's a very large grouping of organisms. As such, trilobita was a very large group of organisms. So far, 25,000 species have been described. And that number grows bigger every single year. As more and more of these creatures get discovered, that number grows. Uh, not only did trilobites have a class all of themselves, they took up a significant portion of an entire subphylum, which was more or less trilobites and friends, lots of similar organisms that aren't trilobites proper but have very close evolutionary relationships. And this unranked clade called Artiopoda includes even more of similar trilobite-like or trilobite -like organisms. Um, this kind of unranked clade is not something Linnaeus had in mind when he made up this classification system way back in the day, but nature doesn't quite match his very formulaic system. It's much more complicated. Groups of organisms don't fall exactly under his set of rules, so we have to make up, well, I shouldn't say we, but they, uh, in order to properly classify organisms, you need more rankings than what he included, but that's a bit of an aside. You'll see that everything from Artiopoda down has a little cross in front of it. That means those groups are entirely extinct. There are no remaining Artiopods, nor have there been for a very, very long time. Uh, one question I often get when it comes to talking about trilobites is what were their, what are their closest living relatives? And that's a very difficult question to answer. And in order to get sort of an answer, we have to look at early arthropod evolution, which is a mess. This is a phylogenetic tree. This shows how animals are related by just making brackets. So 
whatever is closest in the paired bracket is what a closest what a group of organisms closest relative is. And here, smack in the middle of this mess, that's Artiopoda. And as you can see, it doesn't really have anything it's closely connected to. Uh, in this tree, it's closest to Mandibulata. Other trees put it closer to Chilicerata. I've kept up to this. I've kept up to date on this sort of evolutionary story of trilobites for these past few years, and it moves around. It's still a debated issue as to exactly where trilobites and their relatives fall. But <laughs> Chilicerata or Myriapoda, it doesn't matter because these are gigantic groupings of organisms. Chilicerata includes crabs, shrimp, lobsters, everything like that. Uh, include uh, additionally spiders and scorpions. Myriapoda has everything from centipedes, millipedes, ants, butterflies. It's a gigantic grouping of organisms. So it's there are no close relatives of trilobites left anymore. They are such a basal group of arthropods that them and all of their relatives are extinct. Uh, so there is no way to easily answer that question. People often point to horseshoe crabs because they look similar, but in reality, they're no closer to arthropod to uh, excuse me, no closer to trilobites than most other existing arthropods. Um, so yeah, that's where they fall evolution-wise, and it's still a problem that's being worked on. Arthropods have a very interesting evolutionary history, and it's a big point in invertebrate paleontology right now. When it comes to defining what a trilobite means precisely. The name trilobite means three lobes. This is in reference to their body structure. When you start learning about trilobites, like I did many years ago, you'll start to come across a lot of terminology. And the three most common words you come across in trilobite terminology refer to these three groups of the, these three, they're called tagmata, but it's just groups of segments in the body. The first is the cephalon. This is the head. This includes the eyes, the mouth, which is on the underside. Um, and this raised portion in the middle, which is called the glabella, uh, the glabella actually had the stomach. So they had their stomachs and their heads, which is kind of unique, but it's a bit of an aside. Uh, the next grouping is the thorax, which was where most of the body segments were. Uh, this had a lot of the legs, uh, the, the gut, other parts of the digestive tract, nervous systems, and then the pygidium, which is a fused group of segments at the back that functioned as a tail. These are not the three lobes of a trilobite. Uh, when I started learning this, this tricked me, and it tricks a lot of people who learn about trilobites. The actual lobes the name refers to is the axial lobe, which is the raised portion running down the middle, and two pleural lobes, which are the flattened lower portions off to the sides. Uh, just about everyone falls for this when they're starting to learn about trilobite, because more often than not, you see cephalon, thorax, and pygidium used much more frequently than axial and pleural lobes. So I figured I might as well trick you all as well. Trilobites, when it comes to their existence in geologic time, are very old. Right here, we're looking at the Phanerozoic, which is a very large grouping of time. It goes back to a little more than half a billion years ago uh, and goes until the modern day. When you're looking at the Phanerozoic, you can kind of break it down by the most popular fossils that show up. In the most recent grouping of time, the Cenozoic, we have uh, the mammals. In the Mesozoic, we have the dinosaurs, and they get plenty of attention, so we're going to move on from them. But the Paleozoic, the first era here, is a little harder to just give a representative fossil because a whole lot showed up in the Paleozoic. A lot of the organisms we're familiar with today got their start in this period of time. It, was the, it saw the emergence of the first land plants, the first vertebrates on land, the first vertebrates in general, and a lot of other things that we're used to seeing on an everyday basis. Most arthropods, uh, amphibians, reptiles, stuff like that. A whole lot of life we're familiar with in the modern day evolved in the Paleozoic. And it was a very large chunk of time. This is when large organisms really had their start. Going further back, you can find stuff that is more complicated than bacteria and, and the like. But in the Paleozoic is really when they got their start. But I would say the most representative fossil of the Paleozoic is the trilobite because they were around for almost all of it. This is a closer look at the Paleozoic. These are the um, periods of the, the Paleozoic is a geologic era, which are broken down into periods. These are the periods of the Paleozoic. Uh, and trilobites come in right here, 521 
million years ago. That's a little over half a billion years ago. And they made it through all of it till the very end, 252 million years ago. Trilobites were around for 270 million years. They've been gone for 252. So they were around for longer than they've been extinct, which is pretty remarkable when you take into account the sheer scale of time we're looking at here. And this is, uh, I'm going to go on a little side note here because it's pretty interesting. If I were to give this presentation a week ago, as it, that was when I was building this presentation, I was planning to say that trilobite evolutionary history goes back even further because when they first appear, they're already very diverse. Uh, when trilobites first appear in the lower Cambrian, almost immediately they have multiple orders. There lots of species appear. They have an almost global distribution. And for many years, the explanation for this was they already existed. They just weren't being fossilized. So some estimates had them going back hundreds of millions of years more to explain the apparent diversity they had when they first appeared. But just last week, last Friday, a paper came out in Nature detailing how trilobites didn't just do that. They appear exactly where they seem to appear 521 million years ago just thanks to some distribution methods and open niches, they really were to, they were able to radiate and evolve into such a diversity as they appear to, as they did. So <laughs> in clearer terms, there is no secret hidden evolutionary history of trilobites. When they show up in the geologic record is when they showed up on Earth. Uh, this is actually overturning many years of hypothesis. It's a kind of a big thing in trilobite science, and it goes to show that there's still a lot to be learned. These have been studied for a very long time, but it's still very much an active field of study. But all of that's a bit of a, a side note. So at the end of the Permian, getting back to this, trilobites were reduced to one order, the proeatids. Uh, but when they started, they also had one, the red lichens. And in between there, they exploded into all of this. These are the 10 currently or, uh, recognized orders of trilobites. Now, or, an order, we're getting back to Linnaean taxonomy. An order is another grouping of organisms and comparing it to um, humans. We belong to the order of the primates. So everything from lemurs to us is an order. And every one of these is an order. So you're looking at a lot of diversity here. Uh, some people say that there are 11 orders of trilobites. Uh, there's a lot of argument about these guys, the agnostids, uh, they have some characteristics that are very trilobite-like. They have some other characteristics that are very not trilobite-like. And there's a, there's a lot of debate about them. I'm personally of the opinion that they are not proper trilobites, but I don't really have the, uh, the authority to make that <laughs> decision. Uh, up in the upper left, we have the, uh, the red lichens, which are the very first group of trilobites. But almost immediately, they're followed by the tychoparids, which are right beneath them. And just to the right are the Corynexicids, which followed almost immediately afterwards, all in the lower Cambrian. They exploded in diversity, and throughout the next few dozen million years, almost all of the remaining orders also evolved. They had very, very rapid diversification. They were very successful in the lower Paleozoic and very successful in the fossil record period. Uh, they're... First off, I should make the distinction that all trilobites were marine. They all lived in Earth's oceans. As far as we know, trilobites did not live in any freshwater. They didn't really come onto land, but we'll get on. To, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, they were strictly marine, and they the diversity you see reflected here in these different orders reflects the diversity of lifestyles. Most of them lived on the sea floor, but some did take to the seas uh, in a swimming capacity. And they, in in that regard, they also diversified. Many were predators, some were filter feeders, some were detritus feeders. Uh, they explored a wide range of ecological niches and a wide range of morphological forms, which we're going to explore a lot later on. So trilobites are prolific. They were very diverse, and they show up a lot in the fossil record. And that has to do with one unique evolutionary development that set them aside from all other arthropods in the Paleozoic, and is why they appeared so suddenly. It has to do with their exoskeletons. Arthropods have exoskeletons, as we've discussed already, and these exoskeletons are generally made out of chitin. 
It's an organic polymer. This molecule here with a bunch of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and a little bit of nitrogen forms into long chains. You can build it into a tough, waterproof, somewhat flexible substance that's very useful if you need a harder outer covering on your body. It's functionally comparative to kite, uh, yeah, keratin, which is what makes up our hair and fingernails. They're very different molecules, but functionally, they do very much the same thing. Now, most modern arthropods have exoskeletons made of this. Most ancient arthropods had exoskeletons made of chitin. Uh, but the problem with chitin is it doesn't fossilize very well. When it comes to fossilization, you need hard body parts generally in order for them to mineralize and preserve through vast quantities of time in solid rock. And chitin is organic. It decomposes very easily. It rots away. You need very, very specific preservation circumstances in order to get chitin to show up in the fossil record. Uh, and that's not widespread. So why are trilobites so diverse and well-preserved? It's because they figured out how to add something else. The very first proto-trilobites took chitin and began weaving something else into the molecular structure. And that was calcium carbonate, better known as calcite. Uh, this is a very common mineral. It's common in the Earth's crust. It's common in everything. It's all over the planet. Calcium carbonate is hard. Uh, and when you mix it with chitin, it makes a very nice resulting material. It has the hardness of calcium carbonate, but it's more flexible, less brittle thanks to the chitin. Uh, it's a really useful structure, and the trilobites were, as far as we know, the first things to figure it out. They're not unique in this. Other mar modern arthropods have also stolen the classic trilobite formula. Crabs and lobsters also do the same thing with their exoskeletons. They mix in calcite with chitin. It's very useful, and since calcium carbonate is a mineral, it preserves very well. Minerals make up rocks, so if you're making your body with a component that already exists in rocks it's much easier to preserve. So a lot of trilobite success in the fossil record is mostly reflected by the fact that they just fossilize more easily. They appear very diverse, but some of that diversity may be just the result of good preservation. They show up disproportionately because it was very easy for them to fossilize. Uh, it was a very unique innovation at the time. It made their exoskeletons harder than most other arthropods, and that gave them a serious advantage. But this wasn't the end of their innovations with calcite. This is getting ahead of myself a little bit um, in the order of things, but it's so important and so unique that I think it deserves a little bit of time. When it comes to calcite, trilobites did something entirely unique within the animal kingdom. No other group of animals before or since, as far as we know, have done this. And it's really remarkable. And it has to do with their eyes. Oh, for, oh excuse me. First off, we need to talk a little bit about mineralogy in order to get to this point. Uh, here on the calcium carbonate little molecular structure, you can see some little vector arrows with A, B, and C. These are axes. Well, when it comes to mineralogy, you can quantify a lot of characteristics of minerals using axes, the way they're the faces of a growing crystal orient, and more particularly here, how light passes through a crystal. That's not a perfect explanation of crystal axes. I'm not a mineralogist, so if you are, forgive me. Uh, but what the point is here is light passes through a calcite crystal in different ways, depending which axis it enters the crystal along. And it just so happens that if light passes along the C axis, along the length of the crystal, it doesn't get refracted. It doesn't get messed with whatsoever. It will come out the other side of the crystal, the exact same light that went in. So trilobites took this and this optical property, and they applied it in a way that's optically relevant. And it has to do, like I said, with their eyes. Arthropods have compound eyes. Our eyes are made of a single lens that processes light and sends it back to our brain and makes an image. But arthropods use tons and tons and tons of little lenses, often built out of an organic molecule, um, in order to catch lots and lots and lots of individual pictures and then process them all into one image. It's why flies are so good at getting away from you when you try to swat them. They can see a whole lot. Uh, trilobites did the exact same thing. They also had compound eyes. But every lens of a trilobite eye was made of a single crystal of calcite. Each lens was grown out of a crystal. 
uh, grown along the C axis, oriented outwards. So when light hit the lens, it traveled straight down until it hit the, uh, the organic bits at the bottom, which could actually process it. They were using rock material to build their eye structure. Nothing else in the animal kingdom has ever done this. It's really quite remarkable. And it's one of the things that gets talked about the most about trilobites. Is they had very advanced, really unique eyes. And it doesn't just stop with the fact that they use calcite to build them. Trilobite eyes are very diverse and very interesting. Uh, first off, trilobites had these eyes that kind of had a, a curved structure. So they, they've, in the front, they faced forwards. And in the back, they faced backwards. Some trilobites, like this one, had a range of vision that was almost 360 degrees. They could watch their own backs. It's pretty hard to sneak up on them. It's a really useful trait. Uh, they didn't stop here. Some had gigantic eyes with tons and tons and tons of little lenses, which allowed them to see probably very clearly. They may have had some of the best vision of any arthropods ever because they were just able to process so much incoming light. Um, others took these already remarkable eyes and stuck them on stalks, like this asophis from Russia. Uh, this trilobite was probably able to bury itself under the sediment and have its eyes stick up above so it could do whatever it needed to do while safely buried and could still watch its surroundings. And in probably my favorite example, <laughs> trilobites gave themselves sunshades. This is a trilobite from Morocco, and the little brim you see at the top is like a baseball cap. It is hypothesized that this brim existed to keep the sun out of the trilobite's eyes. This means it was probably living in sunlit water. It has lots of e ecological implications, but it's also just kind of cool that they were shading their own eyes uh, with just a little brim. So the trilobite eye is very, very remarkable. But the trial by exoskeleton in general has more that needs to be addressed. So getting back to their preservation, trilobites are very abundant because in the fossil record, because they could very easily fossilize. Uh, and they were also, they also overrepresented themselves in the fossil record. This is Elraithia kingii. This is one of the most abundant trilobites that we know of. It's found in my home state of Utah. There's some commercial quarries on land that have lots of them, and they ship these out to rock shops across the world in the thousands every year. There's a scientific publication describing how Elraithia can be found in the rock in densities of up to 500 individuals per square meter. That's a whole lot. This is only uh, four, but you get the idea. They're often found in clusters like this because they were doing very well in their ecosystem. Between... These are from the Middle Cambrian, shortly after trilobites arose, so they were doing very well because of their exoskeletons. It's hypothes hypothesized this particular species did very well because it had invaded a niche that was not well utilized at the time, particularly low oxygen water, but that's a little bit of, it's just a fun fact. Uh, I've dug a lot of Elraithia, and while lots of them are very pretty and look like this, a lot of them also look like this. They're missing pieces. In fact, most of the Elraithia you find look like this. They don't have these things called the Libergina. It's these also known as free cheeks. There are parts on the side of the head. And in a lot of trilobites cases, you find them gone. When you discover a trilobite, the Libergina are not present. And this is by design in a way. Trilobites had to grow through molting. Uh, and that's the process by which they would split either the free cheeks or the whole head off and crawl out through the front of their pre-existing body. Uh, what would crawl out would be a softened version of a trilobite, which would then inflate itself a little bit and then quickly reharden a new exoskeleton. This is how you have to grow when you have an exoskeleton. Uh, all arthropods do it. If you've got the stomach for it, you can look it up on YouTube. It's not a pleasant thing to watch. It's, it's pretty unsightly, but they've been doing it for hundreds of millions of years and it works pretty darn well. Uh, but the, the whole point of this ecdysis, which is the scientific term for molting, is they would generate many copies of themselves throughout their lives. As they grew from a tiny little larva floating in the water to a many segmented adult, they had to shed their skin many times. And since their, shin, their skin was calcified, every copy they made of themselves, every time they grew and dropped an exoskeleton on the ocean floor, they upped their chances, chances of being fossilized. When it comes to the fossilization process, most organisms, in fact, the vast majority of organisms that have ever existed on this planet will not fossilize. 
It's just, it's not a very likely occurrence. But if you generate the hard parts of your body that are likely to fossilize dozens and dozens of times within your lifetime, you have a better chance of representing yourself in the fossil record. So the sheer abundance of trilobites that appear in the fossil record may not be entirely due to the fact that they were extremely successful in their environments, but because they just were overrepresenting themselves in the fossil record. Uh, this is not always the case. There are instances where trilobites were very abundant because they were living in the right zone for fossilization, but this definitely helped them to be very, very abundant since the very beginning. So there is something to be said there that trilobites did play a big part in the ecosystem, especially because they came about so early on, but they are overrepresented. Uh, when it comes to the exoskeleton, it's what we often find. It's the hard part that preserves, as I've already said. But even from just the hard parts of the organism, we can learn a whole lot. And one of those things is about their defense and behavior. Uh, from the very beginning in the Cambrian, we get trilobites with spines. Uh, you, having a harder exoskeleton than most other life at the time, or at least arthropods, gave them an advantage. But the evolutionary arms race never stops, and other weird arthropod predators were always figuring out ways to get past the hardness of an exoskeleton and eat a trilobite anyways. So they started putting defensive spines on, almost immediately, some a little spinier than others. This worked pretty well when it came to uh, defending themselves, but as always, evolution keeps going on, and things got more complicated for the trilobites. Early on, they just had to deal with other arthropods and possibly other trilobites, but more things began to show up in the world around them. There were big cephalopods, stuff like squids with shells, early ammonoids that would hunt them down and that just encouraged them to be spinier. And another problem that showed up in the trilobite world was fish, vertebrates. Now, the first fish that showed up didn't have jaws yet. They hadn't figured out how to actually move their mouths. They just had little open mouths that would suck any food they could get close to in. Uh, but one way to get around that is just make your spines very long so you had too much surface area to fit in their mouth. Lots of trilobites and early brachiopods are hypothesized to have done this. This trilobite is from the Silurian, which is when fish were really starting to take off. And it's likely that these big long spines weren't actually trying to poke away predators since they do look fairly delicate, but rather they were just creating too much projections for them to fit inside the mouths of predators. But as time went on, fish did figure out how to move their jaws uh, and that presented more problems for the trilobites, and they responded in kind. Trilobites were ridiculously spiny by the Devonian. This is a lot of the most famous trilobites are these ultra spiny, almost absurd looking creatures from the Devonian. And uh, it seemed to work pretty well for them, at least for a while, but we'll get into their decline later. So trilobites like to put spines on themselves. It seemed to work very well, uh, but they also, their exoskeletons that are preserved also show different behaviors. There's also vulvation, no, also known as enrollment. If you think about pill bugs, they do the exact same thing. When they're threatened, they roll up into a nice hard ball that's difficult to crack open to get at the softer parts on the underside, which we'll get to. Other organisms do this too, like armadillos. Uh, and lots of trilobites are found in this position, rolled up tight. And this is probably because they were trying to defend themselves from the conditions that buried them. A lot of the best preserved trilobites are preserved thanks to rapid burial in what was called a turbidite or an underwater landslide. And when the whole world starts sliding around you, these creatures probably rolled up tight in an effort to protect themselves, and which was not at all successful, but it gives us an insight into how they behaved. Alongside with enrollment, we have stuff like this. This is a conga line of trilobites. Uh, you see this also in modern marine arthropods. Uh, lobsters will do this when they're migrating. They'll form these long, ridiculous lines on the seafloor. And since these organisms are exceedingly ancient, we don't really know why they were doing this. It could be migration. It could be reproduction. Uh, but it is very interesting that they're lining up in such a nice straight line because these were blind trilobites. They had to be giving out some sort of chemical signal in order to know where the leader was. So that's a very interesting point, um, that just by digging enough of these creatures, we can get rare examples like this that show snapshots of their life that are more complicated than just basic behavior, mysterious behavior that we really don't fully understand. Uh, these blind trilobites, as you might imagine, lived in very deep water. When you're in very deep water out of the range of sunlight, you don't need eyes. 
But what's interesting is there are trilobites with eyes often found alongside these blind trilobites. Some trilobites that are discovered have ridiculously large eyes, as we've already discussed. Um, this is These trilobites with very large eyes actually evolved independently from several different uh, orders. And they're pretty rare in general, which is why uh, I couldn't find a copyright-free image or an image from my own collection for one. But you get the idea. They had very large eyes. So what's the point of having very large eyes if you're living in really deep water? Some organisms do try this in order to see what little light gets down there. But the fact that these deposits generally have all blind trilobites mean there was no light at all to bother seeing. The other hypothesis is that the very reduced pleural lobes that you see on this drawing were because they didn't need much of a side of their body. They were trying to streamline. These trilobites had probably left the seafloor. These were probably pelagic, swimming around like shrimp in the open ocean, probably in well sunlit, very deep water. And so when they died, their bodies would sink down to the deep, dark seafloor alongside the blind trilobites, creating a very interesting juxtaposition of the blindest trilobites and the trilobites with the best vision. Um, just as a fun addition, some trilobites decided to add garden implements to their exoskeletons. On the left is a Willicerops. This is from Morocco with a uh, pitchfork on the front of its head. And on the right is a Spathocalamine from the United States with a garden trowel. Uh, these are, <laughs> I've always just thought it was very amusing that trilobites tended to put garden tools on their heads. Uh, but the, the point here is we don't always understand what trilobites were trying to do with their bodies just from their exoskeletons. These are very mysterious. We don't know what the point of these were. There's lots of hypotheses floating around. It could have been for defense, could have been for mating behavior, trying to show off or fight off rivals, uh, could have been related to feeding. We don't really know. We're only seeing bits and pieces of these animals' lives, and it's very incomplete. These will probably always remain mysterious until we actually find some of them locked in combat, or, or who knows? There's a whole lot still to be learned about these organisms. Uh, and while the exoskeletons have given us a great deal to work with, there were more to trilobites. Like any other arthropods, they had soft bits, they had legs, they had antenna. It's just those are made of... Um, chitin without the calcium carbonate mixed in. So without the chitin, you don't get any preservation, usually. There are some rare instances where you get trilobites with their soft parts preserved. These exist throughout the Paleozoic all across the world, but there's one instance in particular that I think really stands out, and so I'm going to let it take the spotlight, and that is the Beecher's Beds in New York. These, also known as the gold bugs, these are not preserved in calcite remnants whatsoever. They're preserved in pyrite. These trilobites were buried in fairly deep water uh, in situations where they were buried deeply and completely almost immediately. And then as things began to break down in the soil around them, bacteria that also lived in the deep marine mud, there were some bacteria that as part of their digestive systems, their metabolisms, they would produce sulfur as a byproduct. And that sulfur mixed with iron in, the, sol in the, uh, the mud that had buried these trilobites and began to fill in the cavities left behind as the bodies rotted away. This means that not only the shell was preserved in pyrite, but as you can see here, the legs and the antennae too. Instances like this give us a view of what these parts of their bodies look like. Trilobite legs we have found are biramous. They're split into two parts. The lower part of the leg is used for walking, uh, just carrying them along the seafloor, but there was a branching part of the leg that was actually a gill. So they were breathing through their legs, which is quite interesting. Some other trilobites also have these spiny projections coming from the inside of their legs that were probably, when those are found, they're indicative of predation. It means those trilobites were probably predators because they were using those spines to hook onto prey with their legs and then carry it up to the front of the body where the mouth was. Um, but we get more than legs and antennae. Sometimes we get other little rare glimpses at the trilobite life, like in this specimen. This is a ventrally preserved uh, uh, specimen of these pyrotized trilobites. These both belong to the same species. These are triarthrus eaten eye. Um, but this, this is ventral, meaning it's upside down. We're seeing the belly of the trilobite, more or less. And what you can see off to the right side of the head, are these little dots right there. 
And these dots, after being looked through under a very high-powered microscope, were determined to be eggs. So trilobites, we now know, at least triarthrus, protected its eggs, stuck them on the undersides of their heads, and carried them around. It's a teeny glimpse into very ancient behavior, but it is behavior. We're seeing how these organisms acted millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. There's lots of really amazing discoveries like this all across the world. There's other trilobites where you can see tracks of their gut throughout the body and in the head. There's some that may even show nervous systems and their rudimentary brains. And there's some implications from that that is very interesting, especially for arthropod evolution, but that requires getting into the weeds and we only have so much time. Uh, there is other non-exoskeleton remains of trilobites that have very interesting implications, but are a little less flashy, like these. These are arthropod footprints, more or less. Uh, you can find them in the geologic record from both marine and terrestrial sediments, but these came from tidal flats, places where the shore is very, very flat. And so when the tide would rise, it would come very far inland. These are Cambrian tracks. Uh, a fun, fun fact is during the Cambrian, the moon was much, much closer to the earth. Uh, the moon is very, very slowly spiraling out from the earth. But during the Cambrian, half a billion years ago, um, it was much closer. So tides would have been significantly higher, meaning the tidal flats were probably wider. It doesn't have all that much implication here. It's just something that I've always thought is very interesting. These tracks we're looking at are not actually what I'm implying. They're not trilobite tracks. These are arthropod tracks from tidal flats from the Rome formation, uh, which shows up in the Appalachians. But in a recent field trip that had a re scientific report on it, sometimes that happens. Field trips get scientific reports written up about them. Um, tracks very much like these were found that match trilobite tracks on tidal flats. They were probably made by something very much like this, uh, early red licket and olanellid. Um, I, I can't remember the exact species, but I believe it was an Olinella species that were matched to these tracks. And these tracks were found on tidal flats, implying that every once in a while, trilobites might have left the ocean. Like I said, there's no known remnants of trilobites in freshwater or on land for any long period of time. But it's very possible that on occasion, as long as I could keep water on their gills, they could venture onto land. And who knows why? What drove them to do this is very mysterious. Um, this field report reports they came across these tracks. I couldn't find any photographs. Uh, they, were in, they were in the rock, and apparently it was either too difficult to remove or wouldn't be safe to remove. So they're still out there somewhere. But it's very possible that more trilobite tracks on land may still exist and more implications for their behavior, but they just may not have been found. Uh, and trilobites might have done well to explore a little more of the world than the ocean because throughout the late Paleozoic, they went into decline. This is a graph showing extinctions. Um, so here on the very, the spike over to the right at the end of this little K, this is the extinction that killed the dinosaurs. 30% or so of species going extinct. Uh, but this spike between the uh, P and the TR, this is the end Paleozoic extinction or the great dying. It's aptly named. This graph has this line hitting 50%. I've read other papers that say that marine extinctions might have gone as high as, I think, 85%. Let me check my notes. Yeah, 85%. That's a lot of species. So what happened here was catastrophic. It obviously makes the big famous event that killed off the dinosaurs look a little bit small by comparison. And the general theory right now is that gigantic volcanoes erupted in what is now Siberia. Uh, which is always bad for the planet, but these gigantic volcanoes happen to erupt through, up through recent coal deposits, burning colossal amounts of carbon dioxide, releasing it into the atmosphere, changing the atmosphere chemistry, changing the ocean chemistry. When you introduce lots of carbon dioxide to the ocean, it creates acids, which then dissolve the shells of creatures that build shells with calcite like trilobites. Now, a lot of the trilobites we've looked at and a lot of the trilobite success happened over here on the left in the Cambrian and the Ordovician. This is where they appear in the geologic record. This is where they spiked. They had their heyday in the early Paleozoic and they did very well throughout the Silurian and the Devonian, but they were in a slow decline. And at the end of the Devonian, their, dev their decline happened very rapidly. What exactly was killing them off is not exactly clear. It could be that other life on the world is 
on Earth had caught up to them and forced them into niches more on the edge, places where they couldn't fit in as well. Uh, it could have been other environmental factors, things we haven't figured out yet. One way or another, by the end of the Permian, when the Great Dying happened, there weren't many trilobites left, and with 85% of marine species going extinct, or excuse me, marine genuses going extinct, they didn't stand much of a chance. And this marks the end of their story, uh, which is, for trilobite lovers like me, a little sad. We always hold out a little hope that they might show up in the deep ocean someday, but with 252 million years between the last known instance and now, it's not very likely. But trilobites have still done a great deal to inspire humans, these weird creatures that have come so many hundreds of millions of years after they vanished and really captured our imaginations. Going back to El Raythea, this little species from Utah, this has been found in Native American burial sites, often with a little hole bored through it. It was probably kept on um, pendants or amulets. Uh, there are some reports saying that there was some sort of significance assigned to them. I don't know how accurate that is. But one of the papers describing the Native American collection of trilobites is uh, the name they gave to them. And the name roughly translates to little water bug in stone, which, well, more or less, they got it right on the nose. Uh, so trilobites have been collected since prehistoric times. They've captured human curiosity. There's other instances in Europe where um, trilobite specimens show up with human remains or with archaeological artifacts that look to have traveled a very long way with no local provenance, meaning that they are probably traded um, just as cur curiosities. And the first trilobites kind of held the same, well, the first trilobites described in science held the same relevance. When they were first discovered, they were thought to be fish. They were curiosities. No one really knew what they were, but throughout time, they've garnered more and more attention. And by the time this guy came around, they caught his eye. This is Darwin. Trilobites presented a problem for Darwin uh, because they appeared, as we've discussed, very suddenly in the fossil record. The development of their calcitic exoskeletons means they appeared very early on before many other large complex organisms show up in the fossil record, which threw his theory of evolution into a, a loop for a while. Uh, they presented a problem for Darwin and he, was, he discussed them quite a bit in the origin of species as being a mystery in his theory, which has since been figured out. They just had a development that made them appear out of nowhere when any, where everything else didn't preserve very well. But yeah, they, trial bites attracted Darwin's attention and they've also attracted the attention of a lot of important points in modern science. This is Paradoxides. This trilobite is named because it, well, paradoxical. It's, a, its appearance was kind of paradoxical when it first started showing up in places where it wasn't supposed to. This trilobite, when it lived, uh, was being preserved in oceans that are now preserved in Europe and a, I think a little bit in Africa. That's where they properly belonged. And back in the Paleozoic, the sediments that would eventually end up in Europe and Africa were very far away from other things things where, let me rephrase that. This trilobite lived in a zone in the ocean that would, should only be preserved in modern day Europe and Africa. But Paradoxides has been found in North America, particularly on the East Coast, in Newfoundland, I think in New York, uh, but it's not, it was not supposed to be there. The place where it lived during the Paleozoic was very different, unless you take plate tectonics into account. This was one of the fossils that came up quite a bit in the plate tectonics argument when that was being explained because it was showing that North America and Europe had been smashed together at some point and then ripped back apart. And deposits with paradoxities in them were left behind in North America. It's since been confirmed that the places in Eastern North America where paradoxities occurs are in fact leftovers from European basement rock smashed into smashed together with America hundreds of millions of years ago. And trilobites are still a big part of science today. They uh, are playing a part in the big complicated mess I mentioned earlier of arthropod evolution, particularly early arthropod evolution, which is very poorly understood. So they, outside of the scientific and academic sphere, they also draw in a lot of collectors and uh, amateurs because they're cool to look at. I think I showed enough examples to prove that. And they just, they continue to inspire and draw in human curiosity and give us a very detailed and very long lasting glimpse of a very ancient world 
that doesn't always afford a clear view of itself. And that's one of the very many reasons why I've become so attracted to them. So trilobites are, in my opinion, I think they deserve a little more credit than the dinosaurs. They were along for uh, much longer. They were around for much longer and they had just as much diversity of form. And for those of us who like a little bit of uh, invertebrates, they're very, very, very compelling. Uh, and that's trilobites in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. And we do appreciate it. Um, I don't think that was fantastic. I really uh, enjoyed every minute of it. Um, oh. uh, now we're going to open the floor up to questions. So, so uh, anybody who is in here, feel free to um, turn on your mic. And if you would like to ask some questions, uh, now would be an excellent time to. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I actually had a question myself, uh, John. So um, I, uh, you may have mentioned this, but I had not. I, I must have uh, either missed it or um, the dietary for trial bites. What would their primary um, um, consumption be, and what you know, did it vary on species versus species? Yeah. So there's a whole lot when it came to what trial bites ate. Uh, a lot of them were probably bottom feeders, <laughs> crawling around on the ocean floor, looking for whatever bits and pieces they could find sitting around in the mud. Some of them might have actually sifted through the mud, just picked through it with their legs, fed it up to their mouth, would see if they could find anything good in it, and if not, toss it aside. They probably spent all day, every day, just feeding mud up to their mouths, looking for good juicy tidbits, and then throwing everything else aside. They were kind of what a lot of crabs do today, just picking through the ocean floor for anything tasty in the slime. Uh, but some other trilobites did very different things. It, it's a little hard to tell exactly, um, just based on the exoskeleton, what they ate, but there are some clues in the shape of the glabella, big round part you can see in the center of their head. Um, depending on the size of that, there's some ideas as to what they were eating. Uh, I think... I think the ones with really large glabellas are hypothesized to have been eating algae, stuff that needed a little more work to break down. The smaller the glabella, I think it means they were predatory. I might be getting that backwards. Um, I haven't read a lot into that. One of the best clues as to what a trial by eight is if you can find its legs. If you can find these things called nathobases, which are these spiky bits, then you know that they were probably trying to hold on to prey with them. And there are certain species where we found that. There's a very famous species called Olenoides that's found throughout the uh, Middle Cambrian, throughout Canada, um, the United States, and I think in China. And they found examples with the legs preserved with these big old spikes. So actually, I think if we backtrace, I've got one in here. We, there we go. That right here, the second one is an Olenoides, these big spiny ones. Um, and they're interpreted as being predators. Uh, and they may have been eating other trilobites. They were usually the largest trilobite in their ecosystem um, and predatory. So they were probably either picking worms out of the mud or any little arthropods or other trilobites they could find. There's some other trilobites that are also being interpreted as predatory. Um, some are thought to be filter feeders. A whole group were once thought to be filter feeders. If we go back to the um, orders of trilobites, yeah. The... Um, I think the harpetids and the trinucleids. The trinucleids are actually a brand new order. They were just broken off from another order, I think a couple of years ago, might've been last year, but they're a new grouping and they have these little pits along the side of their head. For a long time, it was assumed these were somehow being used in a filter feeding capacity, but that's now being argued. It's been argued for a while. Uh, instead, they, those might've been sensory it's again, it's hard to tell when all you have to work with is the hard parts and very little to do with their behavior. Um, so some were probably filter feeders, picking through the water for bits to eat. Others were picking through the mud for little bits to eat. Some were eating other things. Some might have been grazing on microbial mats or algae. Uh, another part that gives you a hint of what they were eating is this thing called the hypostome. I didn't feature it, but the hypostome, hypostome was a calcified bit of their exoskeleton that. Um, was opposite to the glabella, which had the stomach. So it was a mouth part on their underside. So 
when they fed food up to the mouth, they could use this little calcite plate to help process it. And based on the shape and size of that, you can also get an idea on their diet, but that's a, that's a whole can of worms to open up is to get into hypostome shape. So, so it's for a lot of species, it's still a question mark or a probably was a predator or probably a detritivore. Um, yeah, lots of question marks, but yeah, they, they were pretty diverse, eating just about anything they could. Fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions they would like to ask? I was wondering with the um, shedding of the exoskeleton, if there's any way of estimating what their lifespan might have been. Ooh, I don't know about that. Um I, th I don't know if any estimates have been made. I would imagine probably only a few years, especially when you look at modern arthropods. Um, they generally only live a few years, but some can probably, I think they get up to a decade or more in some cases. Look at cicadas. But so when it comes to trial bite growth, they started out as a little teeny larva, um, just more or less a head and a tail stuck together that you are interpreted as often being planktonic, just floating around in the water. But they grew by adding segments onto their body from the tail, actually. So they would sort of bud segments off as they molted and grew, gradually adding them. And once they reached a certain number, they were considered an adult. Uh, but it's very hard to figure out how many times they did that exactly. There are some attempts that have been made. The species Elrathia that I mentioned earlier has had its life cycle looked at very, very closely. But it's almost impossible to tell how often they were molting. There's just not enough small scale time observable in the geologic record to figure out how often they were molting, how quickly they were growing. Um, so I don't believe anyone really knows. There may be some obscure papers out there I haven't seen, but I don't think anyone's actually nailed down the problem of how long trilobites lived. But I would imagine a few years to maybe a decade for the really big ones. Um, generally, you have to live a long time in order to get pretty big. Uh, for example, the upper left corner, that's a specimen of Olenellus that's abnormally large. That's a Olenellus gilberti, which is a lower Cambrian species. And generally when you find those, they are a couple inches, but every once in a while you get monsters like that one that are breaking five, six, seven inches that were probably just dodging obstacles and getting really big. And there's some argument to be made that a lot of trilobites probably didn't have a size limit uh, they probably would just keep living on and getting bigger, kind of like reptiles, as long as they could keep eating and avoiding predators. So they might have been able to live as long as they could dodge predators or not have any disease, but no one knows what that number is exactly. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, John, I had a question uh, regarding size as well. Yeah. Um, now, where do you, because we've seen, uh, I've seen some that are small. Uh, mm -hmm. You just mentioned some that could get to, I believe you said five to six inches. Um, yeah. Is it, do, do you see the larger ones in their, uh, what do you call it, golden time uh, in the middle of the Paleozoic? Or do you see, I mean, where do you see them the biggest? And when do you see them the biggest? Okay. Um, I actually almost included a slide about trilobite size records, uh, but it didn't quite fit the flow of things. Um, trilobites got big almost immediately. Some of the largest trilobites in the fossil record show up in the lower and middle Cambrian. Uh, and some of these were breaking, oh, I think two feet. They got big really quickly. Uh, it was probably just because figuring out that calcite exoskeleton was a really good leap ahead on a good thing. And, uh, especially the big predatory ones could just keep eating and eating and eating and getting bigger and bigger. So uh, the one I discussed as having implications for um, tectonics uh, and continental drift, uh, paradoxides, those get really big. Those show up very large in the lower Cambrian and the middle Cambrian, um, breaking multiple feet. And generally the big ones showed up, yeah, fairly early on in the prime time of the trilobites. There are some argument as to what is exactly the biggest, uh, but I think uh, the record is held by a species called Isotelus rex. Uh, off on the right, it's a, I don't, this is an Asaphis, I think. Yeah. Um, but Isotelus was a very similar trilobite. Uh, 
that looked just like this this one. Um, and the record was just under three feet. It was found in Ohio, actually. So they, they could get pretty darn big. There's some examples from Africa that also get very large, but there's recently been a discovery of a fauna, a grouping of trilobites in Nevada, actually, in the Devonian, which is the trilobites were still doing fairly well in the, the Devonian. It was right before their big decline, but these are pushing some s- limits. They're getting really big, multiple feet, two plus feet. Um, and they're off. What's interesting is these really big trilobites from Nevada are often small elsewhere. So similar faunas in Morocco are very similar trilobites. They're just smaller. So something was going on there that was just allowing the whole environment to get really big. They're big, um, big lichens big adonopleurids. Adonopleurids tend to be small, but there's some examples out of this new Nevada find that are very large, um, breaking 12 inches. It's So yeah, they, they could get fairly large. Um, it probably just depended on environmental availability of food, and it did spike early on, but it did have some recurrences in the Devonian of very big um, very big trilobites. One of my favorites is one called Drotops in the lower left that yeah, Phacopida, that's a somewhat enrolled uh, Phacops or Morocops species. But Drotops looks exactly like that. It's just the size of a base, uh, not a baseball, basketball. These big, huge um, rolled up trilobites that you often find often with spines. So those were also Devonian. So they could get pretty big throughout the first um, two quarters or half of the Paleozoic. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you very yeah. much for that. Uh, yeah. Anybody else have any questions they would like to ask John? Okay, then. All right. So this has been an absolute privilege. Um, I am... Uh, I'm glad we have this recorded as well, because I'll probably watch this a few more times as well, uh, <laughs> because it is it is very interesting. Um, these creatures are, like you said, it, it's a, it, it is a, uh, a superstar of the Paleozoic. Oh, yeah. Um, so and, and, you know, last but not least, um, jo- what is your absolute favorite, like favorite of favorites? That's um, ooh, that's a tricky question. Um... There's a few contending for that position. Um, one of my all-time favorites is actually here on the screen. It's the representative of Proedida. Um, it's Cephas spides. It's I just like the little trailing spines it has, the weird wide body, little eye stalks. Um, there's some other examples that I think are really fun, mostly Odonopleurids, just because the spininess they achieved was absolutely absurd. Uh, there's one, one genus called Conoprusia, often found in Morocco that had a more or less a cage of spines that grew up from its back and almost encircled the body. It looks absurd. It, it doesn't look like an organism that would feasibly exist, but it shows up in the fossil record. Um, I've actually got one in the prep lab right now that uh, I'm scratching my head as, as how on earth I'm going to clean that one just because it's so ridiculously complex. But I, I really like the Moroccan species. They tend to be often from the Devonian, they tend to be preserved in perfect 3D, uncompressed in these hard limestones. So you see exactly what they looked like in life. You see how their spines oriented. They, they're more or less exact, uncompressed, unsmashed copies of the organisms. And they're just amazing. So I like the spiny ones and the, the weird little oddities that show up in uh, mostly Moroccan rock. Oh, this is, this is probably important. Um, I didn't include uh, citation to slide, which I know is a, uh, an amateur mistake, but to give a vocal citations, uh, most of these, well, about half these images and the figures were provided by Wikimedia, which is all copyright free and was extremely useful. And the rest are pictures from my experience in the trial by world. So that's where these came from. Just credit where credit's due. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Yeah. Um, like I said, that it's absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, um, and we're uh, very grateful that you did this lecture with us. Um, well, thank you for having me. Like I said, absolutely. And we'll, we'll get this recording up. 
uh, soon, hopefully, and we can share it. People can watch. I mean, this is just uh, um, uh, free education here. This is some uh, amazing stuff. Yeah. So, um, well, then I'm going to go ahead. If there's no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and end this Zoom meet. Um, and I uh, wish everybody a wonderful night. Uh, and thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you for coming, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.